Hello and welcome to this lecture. Today we'll be discussing microaggressions and communication. Let's get started. So I really like that the textbook chapter starts off with a case example. And so you can see here some discussion questions that surround the case in terms of, you know, what assumptions might Marie be making about Marshall? Um, how, what are the psychological impacts of making assumptions? Um, what are, how might those different factors in terms of like race, gender, age, et cetera, end up impacting the therapeutic relationship, which we'll talk about a little bit later on in this lecture slide. So I just like when they start out with uh, a case example, because I think that really helps add some context and provides an example of what this might look like and some things to be thinking about. So microaggressions, we've talked about oppression in a previous um, lecture or class. Um, and so something that I wanted to talk about specifically here is the wage gap. And this is a really good example of microaggressions because subtle sexism is represented in terms of unequal and unfair treatment of women. Um, and it's often not something that's recognized or I think that we really pay attention to or think about because um, it's, you know, kind of thinking back, it's pretty normative that, you know, women were uh, stay at home moms and, you know, worked at home. They took care of the house, did the dishes, did the laundry. Um, and when women did move into the workforce, oftentimes they were in positions that were you know, maybe considered a little bit more menial, such as uh, being a secretary or, you know, positions that weren't really important. Um, you know, uh, if you go way back, women couldn't attend college or couldn't get an education. Um, and so that has impacted women currently in many ways. One being, um, you know, aside from like the assumptions that we have about women or uh, women's roles, gender roles in general, um, it's impacted how much money women can make. So women in the U S made 82 cents to every dollar that men earned in 2020. So if you, you know, that doesn't sound like a lot, but if you add that up, women, um, generally made $191 less out of a weekly check, which continues to add up. So that means in 2020, um, a woman made $9,932 less than a man who did the exact same job. I don't know about you guys uh, or, or you students, but I would be really angry and really upset if I were making less money. Um, being in the military, I make the same pay as, you know, anyone else, but it I would probably be making less if I were, um, you know, if I had my own private practice or if I worked in some type of um, maybe a hospital setting or something like that, I might be offered less than a male peer who worked in the same environment. Um, research has shown that women are also less likely to ask for pay raises, um, not only less likely to ask for those, but also ask for them less frequently than male counterparts, which then feeds into being paid less because we don't ask for raises as frequently. Um, and so I don't know, that was 2020. I don't know what it looks like currently. Um, but, and when you look at, so this information is found on narrowthegap.co. Um, the numbers weren't broken out by like, I can't look up specifically what psychologists are making. At least it didn't have that when I created this slide deck, but for women who worked in like physical and social sciences, life sciences in those occupations, they made 83 cents to every dollar that men made, which is $248 out of a weekly paycheck, which adds up to over $12,000, um, in a, an annual year. So yeah, that's definitely, um, a way that oppression shows up in, you know, 2024. Um, and of course you could look at different, you know, you can kind of click through if you, if you're curious about this, like what do engineers make? What do doctors make? What are the the, the pay differences there? So it can kind of be fun to explore and think about, because again, I think it's something that, um, isn't often brought to people's attention in terms of how that can be oppressive and can continue to compound issues when we talk about diversity. Um, particularly if you start to think about things such as, 
um, a lot of times women are the one who, you know, if you're a single household, uh, oftentimes women are the one who are raising children. And so how does that then continue to compound issues if women are also the ones who are making less money, um, working in a job, et cetera, et cetera. So it just, the, it's like a snowball that ends up kind of being pushed downhill and continues to build and build. When we talk about microaggressions and communication, something that also needs to be covered is our thinking, right? Because our thinking, how we were raised, our assumptions all tie into microaggressions and communication. So a schema is a collection of basic knowledge about a concept or entity that serves as a guide or perception in terms of like interpretation, imagination, or problem solving. So for example, a schema, a dorm room, what comes to mind when you think about a dorm room? Well, there's probably a bed, there's probably a desk. Um, all of those things kind of build up assumptions that you would make about a dorm room. There's maybe a microwave, probably a TV. Um, if I say a uh, chair, so I've got pictures of chairs here on the slide, it doesn't matter that the chair is wooden or that the chair is a computer chair desk, a computer desk chair, um, or if it's, you know, I've got a picture of a really fancy chair here on the right. If no matter what it looks like, you have the understanding or the assumption, okay, a chair is something that I can sit on. It's something with either three legs, you know, if it's like a trifecta, um, it's four legs most of the time, as you can see here, the, the computer desk, uh, the computer, I keep saying computer desk, the computer chair has like, you know, it's not four legs, but it's, it's got, it's on rollers, but you understand, okay, I can still sit down on this. And so when we talk about microaggressions, schemas are a big part of that because it's things that we automatically jump to or assume because it's how our thinking or how our brain processes information quickly. So here's a fun little riddle I wanted to throw in here. Let's see if you guys can guess or figure out what this is. So take a minute and pause the video if you need to. Um, a father and a son and a son are in a horrible car crash that kills the dad. The son is rushed to the hospital. And just as he's about to go under for surgery, the person, the surgeon says, I can't operate. That's my son. How is that possible? Well, when I first heard this, I was stumped. I was like, oh, how is that possible? What does that mean? Um, in research studies, very few people are able to correct answer the question correctly or come up with the correct answer. Uh, so did you figure it out? The surgeon is the boy's mom. And so again, kind of going into those gender schemas, and we've talked about gender a little bit in one of the beginning slides, and we'll talk about it here in another slide or two. Um, paying attention to what are our assumptions or schemas around surgeons? Well, we think a lot of us probably think males or have this assumption that, oh, surgeons are males. Um, and a lot of times those schemas are reflected or based on how we were raised, what our personal values or life experiences are. All of those things tie in, in terms of impacting our, what is our first thought when we hear surgeon or what is our first thought when we hear chair, like we saw in the last slide. Um, if you're curious about this little riddle or you want to see some other riddles, you can, you know, type this into your search engine of choice and several different examples will come up to just kind of scratch at your brain and think about kind of challenge some of your thoughts there. Okay, so let's continue talking about gender a little bit longer. So when we're raised, you know, what are some stereotypes or what are some things that were taught growing up for a lot of us? Um, you know, there's kind of been a push, I think, to get away from this. Um, but, you know, boys like blue. That's something that we're taught. Boys like trucks and cars and uh, playing with dinosaurs, right? What kinds of things do girls like? Girls like pink. Um, girls play with dolls. If you see gender reveal parties nowadays, what are the colors that are chosen? Pink for boys. Uh, pink for boys. Pink for girls. Blue for boys a lot of times, right? Uh, nowadays, there's there's been kind of a bit more of a push for gender neutral things, right? Um, so either using like yellow or green as gender neutral colors or, um, you know, sometimes, and, and this has been really interesting, you can see in like, say, new, news articles or that kind of thing where the parents won't, don't want to know the gender of the child so that they and family members 
don't, you know, automatically start to make assumptions about the child before, you know, the baby's even born. So saying like, hey, we don't, we don't want to know what the baby is. We don't want to make assumptions or we don't want to start to treat this child a certain way um, because of their gender. And so I would I'd be really interested in it'd be really interesting to know what research has been done on that and if that's effective in terms of how they treat the child once the child is born, once they do know the gender, um, how that impacts how the child is raised, etc., that kind of thing. Um, sometimes these can be really funny, right, in terms of how um, these assumptions in terms of gender roles, gender stereotypes occur. So for example, um, I used to own a motorcycle and... Um, I got caught speeding once and the police pull, pull, police officer pulled me over. You know, I had to like pull up my ID and that kind of thing. And when he walked up to me and realized, you know, I was wearing a helmet, of course, to be safe. And when he walked up to me and realized that I was a woman, he was like, his, his reaction was kind of funny because he was so caught off guard. He was like, oh, you're, you're a woman. Like, you know, like as if women could never ride a motorcycle or something like that. And so his response was kind of hilarious. It probably actually saved me from getting a, a ticket. I didn't end up getting, he didn't write me a ticket. So, um, <clears throat> but you know, so sometimes responses can be very funny. Sometimes responses can also be very hurtful, right? Um, so for example, I follow a women officer's Facebook page of uh, military, you know, women who are active duty in the military and they'll write comments and sometimes they get really, um, really upset about, you know, like say being at a checkout at a, a store, for example, and either they're in uniform or they and their husband are in uniform. And, you know, whoever is checking them out will thank their husband. I'll like, thank you for your service, sir. That's, you know, so amazing that you serve. And the woman is standing there like, hello, do you not see me? Like, I'm also in uniform, but you're thanking my husband. Um, and so that can be, you know, come across a lot of times as very blatantly disrespectful. Like you're thanking the husband, but you're completely ignoring the fact that the woman is standing right next to him also in rank. Um, also in uniform and sometimes even a higher rank than her husband and she's like completely ignored. Um, so that's just a small example of how sometimes those gender assumptions or stereotypes can be hurtful. So here's an exercise. I want you to take a piece of paper, draw a line down the middle and on one side write man and on the other side write woman. Pause the video at any point if you need time to do this. And now write words or phrases that describe qualities or characteristics of a man under the man's column, men's column, and words or phrases that, you know, characteristics, qualities that describe women under the women's column. So what kinds of words did you come up with? Characteristics did you write down? Adjectives? Um, so here's a couple examples. Men are active. They love sports. They have short hair. They're hardworking. Um, they're the breadwinner, they're strong. And for women, um, thoughts or, or like words or characteristics are loving, nursing, um, they enjoy shopping, they like flowers, they cry easily, they lo have long hair. So are you happy with the list that you've created? I came up with, you know, some, some quick examples, but what did you come up with? And do you see any changes that you would like to make to that list? Are there terms that don't belong under the heading of one or the other? Are there terms that might fit under both headings? So it's applicable to both men and women. Is it fair to say that, you know, all men are breadwinners? Well, no, because there's a lot of women who are breadwinners or there's a lot of women who, um, you know, either work full time and um, their husbands don't work. Maybe their husbands are stay at home or they're single women and, you know, they... There isn't a man in the picture. Uh, what about, you know, saying that all women cry easily? Well, that's probably not true either because you probably know um, a woman who either doesn't cry very easily or is like, you know, like strong woman. Um, and so <clears throat> I think this is a fun little exercise to do to start to challenge our thinking about stereotypes, about gender roles, and start to think about things a little bit differently than how we were raised. So your textbook covers this on page 125 if you're using um, the older edition. And so microassaults, these are something that's very blatant. 
Um, it can be either verbal or nonverbal, but because it's so blatant, it can come off very clearly as a, a, an attack or intended to convey discriminatory or biased sentiment. So this is kind of a range here. Um, so you've got micro assaults, then you've got micro assaults. Micro insults are unintentional behaviors or verbal comments that convey rudeness or insensitivity or demean a person's heritage or identity. And then you've got micro invalidations. Um, so micro unintentional comments are things that are insensitive, but you know the person might lack awareness or not be aware of the fact that their comment can be hurtful. Whereas micro um, invalidations are invalidating someone's experiences. So for example, this might be saying something like all lives matter. Well, that invalidates the fact that black lives are taken more frequently and at a higher percentage than white lives um, or white people's lives. And so kind of paying attention to that spectrum in terms of what types of micro um, aggressions might show up, how they might show up, what they might look like, and are they intentional or unintentional? Like, is the person aware of what they're saying and how that, what they're saying would impact someone else, or are they just, you know, kind of clueless? So if you watch Modern Family, this is a, this is a fun little example. Look at, I, I won't put the video in the slide, but I'll put the, the link in the description. Look at what kinds of microaggressions are happening. Can you spot them? What kinds of assumptions are they making about the doctor because she's Asian? Um, and what kinds of things are they saying in terms of culture, in terms of food regarding their daughter? It's a, it's a fun little clip. Sexual objectification. Um, I just, I should have maybe moved this up in the slide deck, but, um, this is just a, a little meme here of, um, Adventure Time, the Ice King. If you watch Adventure Time, the Ice King is always trying to find a princess. And so he like, uh, abducts princesses and, you know, takes them away to his like, uh, ice castle and keeps them in jail or tries to prevent them from what, running away from him. Um, and this is Jake saying, you know, like, you're always harassing the female, um, you know, you're always ha harassing women, stop doing that. Um, <clears throat> and so again, kind of going back to some of those gender factors that we talked about, how does this consistently or constantly play out in terms of media, in terms of what we see in movies or in TV shows or on the news, in terms of how women are treated like objects a lot of times or are at men's complete disposal. Um, you know, there's been several different court cases recently, legal cases in terms of, you know, women saying that they were raped or saying that they were treated a certain way. And how are they treated because of them coming forward um, how are they treated, you know, in, and how are they treated in comparison to maybe how a male might be treated if, if a man were to come forward and say the same thing. So just something to think about, um, since we talked about gender, this, uh, this lecture. And again, how does that, what does that look like in terms of some of those microaggressions that we've talked about as well? So for example, women, um, being whistled at women being hit on, um, you know, do, do women want to be hit on? Like if you're just walking down the street and someone whistles at you or says, Hey girl, how you doing? Like, do you want to, do you want to be hit on? Do you want that experience? Um, I know for me, I'm married. I don't want to be hit on, right? Like I don't want your attention. I, I have a husband. I don't need your attention. So go away. I don't want that. Um, so yeah, just something to think about. Um, I really like that this does a really good job of discussing why microaggressions are not only important, but are a big deal because micro, right? Micro is small. It's like, okay, well, you know, you could kind of think about it. I think sometimes maybe people think about it. It's like, well, is it really that big of a deal? You know, microaggression, it's just a small thing. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't have that huge of an impact. But this does a really good job of saying, you know, essentially using the analogy or the example of what if microaggressions are mosquito bites? Um, you know, one or two, it's not that big of a deal. But if you get 10 mosquito bites in a day or 20 mosquito bites in a day, like 
that becomes really irritating, right? And I'm chuckling because whenever my husband and I go on vacation, I'm always the one who gets eaten alive by mosquitoes. They're like, the buffet's open, let's eat. Um, and so I'm like irritatedly like slapping at mosquitoes and he's like, why are you freaking out? It's not that big of a deal. Like there's not that many mosquitoes out here. And I'm like, yeah, cause they're not eating you. They're eating me. Um, and so yeah, just a quick little video. I think it's a couple minutes long um, to, to just kind of show that. I think there is one swear word in here though. So just be aware that uh, I think that that occurs. Um, I do want to highlight and very much normalize that I think microaggressions are, you know, we've talked about schemas, we've talked about how we were raised impacts, how we think about things and how we view the world. And so it can be really easy to make microaggressions or make like statements that are microaggressions and not even be aware of it. So for example, um, a couple years ago, you know, I was visiting, I was back home and I was seeing my, my one of my nieces and I said, you know, when are you going to get married? Do you have any plans to have kids? Um, and looking back on it now, I'm like, oh, that was totally a microaggression, right? Because I'm making assumptions about her as a woman um, and what her gender role should be as a woman in society. Um, and again, right, because of how I was raised, because of the assumptions that I'm making, my schemas, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so it can be something that's really easy to do. It's just a matter of, okay, now that we have that awareness about it, what are we going to do? So responding to microaggressions, this might be really small on the video. It is in your textbook. Um, and so there's a, several different ways to respond to microaggressions. I'll get into them in the next couple of slides. So I like that the textbook has examples. Um, you can see in the italicized text there at the top, um, you know, it'll, it like, this is an example. And then what are some ways to respond to that? So one of the biggest ways to respond is to ask clarifying questions and not in a way that comes off as, you know, in a negative, like, well, what do you think about that? Like, you know, don't have an attitude, but just ask questions in a way that's like, hey, I'm curious about this. Again, to increase awareness about it, right? Because that person might be making assumptions, um, you know, micro invalidations or micro insults and not have an awareness that they're doing it. Um, and so how do we just bring awareness to that in a way that's, you know, kind of gentle and helps them realize like, hey, you realize that, um, you know, your thinking here is, is problematic. Um, <clears throat> but also, you know, pointing out that a lot of times it can be, it can be uncomfortable for us, but it is important to say something because again, that person might not even realize that they're doing it. And so if we just bring it to their attention, they might be like, oh yeah, you're right. I shouldn't say that anymore. Um, so for example, one of my friends really likes to kind of joke and like push the button, if you will. Um, and sometimes his jokes are like, okay, dude, you went too far. And so just bringing that to his attention. In his case, he knows that he's doing it. He's he's just, he's joking, but sometimes it goes too far. Um, but a lot of times people don't have that awareness or don't know that, oh, what you said just crossed a line. And so it can be uncomfortable, but just say something and that might increase their awareness of like, oh, this is how I'm being perceived or this is how this came off to someone else or this is how this could be really hurtful to someone else. I didn't even realize that, you know, what I said was was harm hurtful hurtful, harmful, et cetera. Um, so how I might bring something up was like, I'm curious, you just said X, Y, Z, you know, what is your thought process behind that? Or what are your underlying assumptions um, about that? Just to increase the awareness, but I'm coming at it in a very kind of empathic, like, I'm just curious about this, help me understand, um, as opposed to coming across in a, you know, a negative or a kind of an attacking kind of way. So you can see here how some of the tactics are like undermining the undermine the meta communication cha communication challenge the stereotype. Um, so I just kind of talked about like some ways that I would challenge the stereotype in terms of asking some of those clarifying questions or making a clarifying statement. So here the example would be I might be black, but that does not make me dangerous for this specific example. Uh, we've got a couple different other examples here as well. So in terms of disarming the microaggression, 
Um, there's several different examples here in terms of how this scenario, this specific scenario at least plays out and, you know, how you can either um, stop or deflect the microaggression, communicate your disagreement or disapproval, um, et cetera, et cetera. And then another example here. And then, you know, if things continue to persist, and a couple of students in past classes have talked about this, um, you know, at some point, if say you've said something to someone, you've said something, there's no change in behavior at some point, it's beneficial to either report it to your supervisor or, you know, whoever your leadership is, um, talk about it in therapy or counseling to process through your own feelings and emotions, you know, report it up to, for example, you guys are students, so reporting it to the school if there's issues or concerns, um, making sure that other people are aware and people um, who are can make decisions or make changes are aware as opposed to, you know, if you continued, if you're just like, oh, I'm just going to suffer through and, you know, they'll be fine. That's not really being beneficial, one, for yourself, but two, for other people who might also be experiencing the same issue. And so, you know, bringing those concerns up can um, not only be beneficial for yourself, but be beneficial for other students or individuals who might be experiencing the same microaggressions from the same person. Um, so one of your discussion posts, we'll get to the post here in a minute, but some discussion questions that we would discuss in class, if we were in class, is what kinds of microaggressions have you experienced in life? Um, a lot of times students will talk about different microaggressions that they've experienced. And if you haven't experienced any, that's okay. Um, it can be helpful to, you know, read the discussion post in terms of what have your peers experienced. But if you haven't been um, someone who has experienced microaggressions against yourself? Have you been a perpetrator or have you been a person who is, you know, as I gave a, an example earlier, um, you know, ha made microaggressions towards someone else? And if you think back, what does that look like? Um, what are the examples that you can come up um, in your own life? And then what steps would you take in terms of stopping a microaggression or identifying a microaggression in your day-to-day -day life? Something that we haven't talked about yet is what's called intersectionality. And this is a word that was coined in 1989 by Professor Kimberly Crenshaw to describe how race, class, gender, and other individual characteristics all intersect or kind of come together and how they overlap. And how this is important or ties into our class, and you'll probably start to see the word intersectionality quite a bit, is the idea that, so for example, I talked quite a bit earlier about, you know, uh, gender and wage gap and how, you know, I as a female, like, I don't like the wage gap, you know, that doesn't benefit me, of course. And so I can't um, care about gender, um, you know, gender inequality without also caring about racial identity or, um, you know, LGBTQ rights or, you um, disability or other abledness, right? And so essentially it's saying that if I care about whatever this thing is, so for example, um, gender inequality, I also have to care about all of these other inequalities as well, because to care about just one means to care about all of them, uh, because there's so much overlap, right? There's so much overlap across all of those different inequalities, um, and racism and, and, um, inequality for whatever, whatever the thing is, right? Um, whether that's, um, for example, a previous location that I worked at, the building that we were in didn't have any elevators. So if you're someone in a wheelchair, you couldn't make it up to the second floor. Um, and so that's something that like I, as someone who cares about gender inequality would also care about the fact that, Hey, our building doesn't have, you know, access or a way for someone to make it up to the second floor if they needed to for a meeting. Um, and so it's kind of like across the spectrum or across the range, how do we work towards advocacy and work towards making a difference and noticing those things that need to be, um, 
those differences that need to occur, even if it's not something that, you know, maybe I'm not super passionate about, I don't know, X, Y, Z, but it's still, still something that is super important to pay attention to and make sure that we're advocating for those changes. So something to be thinking about in terms of intersectionality, because you'll, again, you'll start to see that a lot as we move forward in the class. Um, therapy implications. This is, um, this YouTube video is cringy on purpose. So I'll put the link in the description. It's about 10 minutes. So it's a little bit longer than some other videos that I typically put in lectures. Um, but you can see the therapist and how he makes all of these microaggressions against the therapy client. And so I think it's a really good example because the whole time you're like, oh my God, dude, the things that you're saying, like at one point he says, well, he says all kinds of stuff that you're just like, oh, you can't say that as a therapist. Like, so when we talk about therapy alliance, we're talking about essentially the working relationship that we have with our client. And we want our relationship to be really good and really strong, right? Because otherwise, if we like this example where the therapist, you know, he makes all kinds of comments that you're like, dude, she's never going to come back and see you as a client because like, you know, you've basically alienated her as a therapy client. You've made all these comments about like, oh, good for you. You know, you made it to MIT, like, wow, you must be a representative of your race, you know, like, oh, you speak really well. Like he makes all kinds of comments that you're like, if I were your, your therapy client, I would never come back and see you ever again. Um, and so that's something to really be paying attention to in terms of our microaggressions, our micro insults. You know, what are things that we're saying to clients that might be alienating them or pushing them away unintentionally or intentionally um, things that we want to be very careful not to say so that we have solid rapport with our clients so that they continue to come back and see us. Um, I can't remember if I've talked about this in a previous lecture, but one of my colleagues, um, you know, was working in a VA setting and she was Latino, Latina. And um, a lot of her clients were saying things, um, you know, that was like microaggression, kind of racial slurs, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, stuff like, uh, if I call the phone number and, you know, it says press one for English, press two for, um, you know, Spanish, like, why do I have to press one? Why can't I just, you know, except like that kind of stuff. Um, and she, she was really amazing in terms of how she took it. Cause she, you know, she didn't let it bother her, but it's something to be thinking about from both a client perspective and a therapist perspective, right? Because micro, micro, um, microaggressions, micro insults, micro invalidations, all of those things go both ways, right? So we can, um, you know, we can have microaggressions towards a client, but a client can also have microaggressions towards us. And it is okay for you as a therapist to at some point say, hey, this is an unhealthy therapy relationship for me as the therapist. And to say, I don't want to continue to see this client because maybe they're, you know, continuing to make microaggressions or micro insults towards you as the therapist, in which case it would be working either with that client and processing through that, or depending on, again, it's going to depend on the situation saying, Hey, this is, uh, this is a situation where maybe it would be beneficial for you as the client to go see, you know, and make a referral to a different therapist, um, for them to go work with someone else. If it becomes something where you as the therapist are no longer effective in the therapeutic space with that client. Um, and so again, that gets into like paying attention to counter transference and some things that you end up talking about in a different class. Um, and so again, paying attention to your own reactions towards the client as my colleague did, you know, she was paying attention to her own reactions and what people were saying to her, um, and that type of thing. And is it becoming negative or harmful to the therapeutic alliance, or is it something that can be worked through? So I'll put the, um, I just think this is interesting because, you know, tech and virtual reality and all of those things have become so popular. And especially after COVID, a huge part of our lives. And so this is some virtual reality where they're using it to challenge biases and microaggressions against people of color in terms of job hunting. 
So it's really quick. It's like, I don't know, a couple minutes. It's not very long, um, but really interesting to see what research is being done out there. So check out the video. All right. So communication, we've, we've kind of talked around communication, I think this lecture, but let's get into it here a little bit. So there's what's called high context communication and low context communication. High context communication is anchored in physical context. It's internalized in the person. It relies heavily on nonverbal and group identification. It's faster. It's more economical, more efficient. Um, very heavily bound to cultural factors, um, can tend to be very cohesive and unifying. Asian cultures tend to be very highly dependent on context cues and tend to be very high context communication. Low context, so this culture places greater reliance on verbal communication. Um, so it's associated with being more opportunistic, individual oriented, emphasizes laws and procedures and rules um, and can change rapidly and easily. The United States is considered a low <coughs> context culture. And so if you think about the difference in terms of communication, like if you watch a TV show or a movie, um, that's so for example, I like to watch uh, Korea, Korean dramas. Um, but if you if you watch any type of um, TV shows or movies, where, you know, for example, you've got subbed or dubbed or, um, you know, English isn't the, the language that's being primarily spoken. You can really kind of start to see some of the examples of how, um, you know, communication styles are very different, even in terms of what's said is very different. And I know it's, you know, movie TV, so it's not necessarily, um, maybe necessarily true to real life in terms of, you know, how people might, um, talk if they were say just at home, but it can give you some good examples of how communication is handled very differently in one culture to the next. And that's something that's really important to be paying attention to and thinking about again, in our role as therapist, how are we communicating with our clients? How are our clients communicating with us? And what are the differences there? Are we able to match or meet our clients um, communication style, or is there kind of a gap there? And if, if so, what does that gap look like in terms of, um, maybe miscommunication or misunderstanding that might be occurring in the therapeutic space? So something that's really important to think about and something that I think, you know, sometimes when we're just getting started as therapists, we're not necessarily thinking about it because we're like, all right, let me get in here and be a good therapist. Um, but yeah, think about communication and how that is playing out because that's such a huge part of uh, therapy since a lot of what we do is just talk. I shouldn't say just talk, but you get what I'm saying. So proxemics refers to the perception or use of personal and interpersonal space. So th something to think about, and for a lot of you guys, it's maybe kind of far down the road in terms of what your office space might look like for a therapy session. You know, are you seated really close to the client or is the client seated really close to you? Are they seated across the room from you, like really far away? Um, sometimes you might, you know, especially if you're a student, you have no control over what the office space looks like. You're just given an office and said, you know, told like, here you go, here's your office. This is where you're going to be in if you're lucky enough to even have an office. But is it something to be thinking about um, cause that is the therapeutic space, right? And so how is that space used? How is it set up? Something to think about body language. So we just talked about this a little bit in terms of those different high context, low context communication styles. Um, and so something to be paying attention to and thinking about, especially in a therapeutic space is what is the body language that's happening does the person sit towards you? Do they sit really far back? Do they sit with their, you know, do they sit with their arms crossed? Do they sit very open, legs crossed, arms crossed? Do they make eye contact, not make eye contact? Um, so a lot of different cues that are happening and that you want to be paying attention to. Um, this is a picture of Treebeard, who's an ent in Lord of the Rings, and he's a talking tree. And it takes him 15 minutes to say anything, to say hello, to greet each other. You know, they talk really, really slowly. Um, 
And so it's also something to be thinking about and paying attention to because sometimes clients will come in and, you know, they're not really kind of saying anything or getting anywhere, going anywhere. They're just kind of like, you know, talking about very kind of surfacey things like, oh, how's the weather? Oh, it's been good. You know, things have been fine, blah, blah, blah. And so again, how do you cue into and pay attention to not only what's being said, but what's not being said? Um, and something that is also something, something that's also important to think about or consider is how comfortable or uncomfortable are you with silence? Um, so, you know, in this situation or this example here, um, tree beard, you know, the ants, it takes them a long time to say anything. And for me, I like, you know, two minutes in, I'm like, impatient, like, okay, just spit it out already. Um, which of course wouldn't work very well in a therapy setting. And so paying attention to what is my own communication style or preferences. And again, I said this in a previous slide, does this match to the client's style and preference and communication approach? Um, and in terms of that silence, it's something that you know, is a skill that you have to build up if you're not comfortable with that silence or that empty space to um, become comfortable with it. Because of course it can be a problem or an issue, right? If you're someone who's not comfortable with that silence um, and you just kind of constantly fill the silence. So you're just talking and talking and you might ask the client a question and then you don't even wait for them to answer. You're just like, oh, okay, well, let me jump in and, you know, go ahead and keep talking. Um, and so it can really take some practice to slow down or to become comfortable with that silence and not fill the space or not constantly have something being said. But if you ask a question, especially something that really requires some thought, um, that you give the, the client then some space to like, okay, let me think about that. That's a good question. Let me think through what my answer is going to be, um, without immediately jumping in and having something like a follow-up comment or question. Um, and so that's something that I've had to practice as a therapist where, um, uh, I'll do this thing where I'll ask like eight questions in one, like, okay, tell me where you were born and raised and how was your childhood and what was it like growing up and who raised you? And do you have any brothers or sisters? Like, okay, well that's like eight questions in one. Right. Um, and so kind of slowing things down and breaking it up so that it's kind of bite-sized, um, questions or things comments for the client so that they're not just like overwhelmed by me, like, go, 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 let's go. So sometimes I maybe need to be a little bit more like tree beard and slow down a little bit. So again, just thinking about the communication styles and how they might differ from you versus your client. So we've talked about this a little bit, but I like that it's broken down into a picture or a table from um, your textbook in terms of different communication styles, how different individuals or um, communities might communicate differently. We've talked about a couple of these already. Um, so just, you can read over the, the slide there. All right, so discussion questions, um, things to that we would discuss in class in terms of what does your communication style look like? How do you converse with others? Do you make a lot of eye contact? Do you smile a lot or frown a lot? What are your body movements? You guys can see that I a lot of times use my hands quite a bit. Um, so just some things to be thinking about. And then a few more questions along those lines in terms of the communication. Are you loud? Are you quiet? Are you soft-spoken? Are you comfortable with the silence? Do you feel like you have to fill the silence in a conversation? Like if you're having a conversation with a friend, you know, can you go a few minutes where you guys, you know, if you're say out for a walk, for example, can you go a few minutes when you, where no one says anything or do you start to feel really uncomfortable? Um, what about the same conversation, but instead of it being your friend, maybe it's your boss at work um, or maybe it's a coworker and, you know, same thing. Do you feel comfortable if there's a long silence or do you feel like you have to fill the space with something? And then here is your discussion post questions. So these are the questions that you'll do your discussion post on. You can see those in the slide there. All right. And then lastly, I wanted to cover a research article. So this is looking at disarming racial microaggressions. And this study examined the relationship between racial microaggressions, either subtle or unintentional in terms of forms of racial discrimination 
and the impact on mental health. So participants, there were a total of 506 participants, 375 were women and 131 were men. And they were recruited in two different ways. So um, one, the main way was it was um, an undergraduate class. And so they are like a pool of undergraduate classes. So they ended up getting most of the participants from undergraduate classes. And then they ended up sending an email out um, and posting it on like several different community websites. And they ended up getting several um, st students from that uh, that way as well. But most of them were undergraduate students who were given a credit um, to participate. So part of their grade was um, through participating in this research. Measures and questionnaires. So demographic questionnaire was used. Participants completed an open-ended demographic form asking them to identify all different kinds of information, like their identify their age, their gender, their race, their ethnicity, sexual orientation, religion, occupation, highest educational level compu completed, place of birth, and years spent in the United States. And then they completed a racial and ethnic microaggression scale, which was is called the REMS is the acronym. So it's a 45 item self-report measure and it has six subscales that look at different, um, you know, subscale categories. And then they lastly completed a mental health inventory, which is a 38 item Likert scale self-report measure that assesses positive and negative aspects of mental health status and well-being. Um, limitations, there were several limitations of this study. One is that the REMS and the mental health inventory are both self-reports. And I think we've talked in previous lectures about how self-reports can um, be biased, right? We can respond in certain ways depending on, you know, if we want ourselves to look good or not look good. So either look healthy or look unhealthy, um, you know, especially if you get any kind of maybe cues from the researcher in terms of what they're looking like, you might respond in a certain way. Um, individuals of color tend to underreport mental health issues. And so that could have negatively impacted the results as well. If, you know, individuals, um, uh, colored individuals are underreporting symptoms, then, you know, their mental health scores might be lower or they might essentially look healthier than maybe they really are. Um, individuals took the, the questionnaires in the same order. So there might have been a priming effect from the first measure onto the second measure. So something to be paying attention to or thinking about there. And then one of the biggest limitations was the sample size. They could have, you know, maybe gotten, um, uh, more people for the sample size. Although, I mean, they got a, a pretty decent number of people, but you, you would definitely want more people in future research studies. And then another limitation is the mean age of the participants was 24. So again, undergraduate students. Um, and so, you know, gra undergraduate students is not necessarily generalizable to the whole U.S. or to the whole population. And so that's uh, another limitation as well. Future research, um, you know, get a bigger sample size. Um, that's something that could be a more diverse sample size. So not just, um, you know, not just undergraduate students, but maybe, um, get individuals from the community because that's going to be more generalizable to the entire U S uh, future research could also explore and focus on understanding other variables, variables between microaggression and say other factors. So for example, maybe self-esteem, personality traits, social support, and how those things or those perceived things influence micro or racial aggressions, racial microaggressions. Um, and then secondly, there were many differences between various racial groups. So paying attention to like future research could maybe look at different groups separately in terms of social identity, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, etc., and how maybe someone's identity influences their perception of microaggressions. Um, and then the results. So the results from the current study suggest that more frequent racial microaggressions, the more frequently that ra racial microaggressions occur, those is incidents negatively impact a participant's mental health. Um, there's a negative significant relationship between racial microaggressions and mental health. So individuals who perceive 
or experience racial microaggressions in their lives tend to experience more mental health symptoms. So for example, increased depression, anxiety, and negative affect. So have a more negative view of the world. Um, and then particular types of microaggressions can also be correlated with negative mental health symptoms. So for example, when individuals experience microaggressions related to being treated like a second class citizen, um, microaggressions in which they are invalidated or in which it's assumed that they're similar to other individuals from their group, they experience more mental health symptoms. Results indicate that the experience of microaggressions may be correlated with specific mental health problems, namely or specifically depression and lack of positive affect, so lack of positive emotions like happiness, contentment, that type of thing. Um, but those correlations specifically were somewhat weak. And then implications, so why should I as a therapist care about this? So first, being aware that there is indeed a link between racial microaggressions and mental health can be helpful in assisting clients to identify and increase their own awareness around microaggressions when they occur, how to cope with them as we talked about in, in this lecture. Um, providing psychoeducational techniques in terms of, again, helping clients acknowledge um, and become more knowledgeable about the concept of microaggression and to feel comfortable discussing it, not only in therapy, but addressing it when it occurs in their personal lives. Um, and third, knowing that different types of microaggressions may affect different racial groups differently can be helpful in terms of paying attention to if you're working with a very diverse population, paying attention or knowing that, you know, microaggressions may impact um, different populations or different groups differently is something that's important to know as well. That way we're not making the assumption that, okay, microaggressions impact everyone the same way. Like, no, that's not the case. Uh, so that was some really interesting research. And here are my references. Let me know if you have any questions, comments, or concerns. Thank you.